A slowdown for police oversight. How the Citizens Commission in National City is struggling to keep pace after the death of Earl McNeil. And Governor Brown is urged by Republicans to call a special session for California's wildfires. Democrat, Republican, this is the right thing to do for our city to move forward. Uh, so we're going to keep pushing. San Diego's mayor talks to KPBS about the delayed vote on a convention center expansion and how it might cost the city millions of dollars. We have to be ready for this influx because you have all these baby boomers coming through that are going to, at some point, need services. And how this recreated village from the 1950s is helping Alzheimer's patients. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Ebony Monet. The Civilian Commission overseeing the National City Police Department met for the first time since Earl McNeil was hospitalized while in police custody. He later died. As KPBS reporter Jane Hyman reports, community activists want the commission to be more productive. Continuously walking around the podium are examples of behaviors that disrupt the meeting. National City's Community and Police Relations Commission is down two people with just six members. They are just now getting caught up on a three-year-old backlog of cases. I hope you plan to take an active and proactive role. After the death of Earl McNeil, some members of the community want the commission to be more consistent and accountable. And this is not the first time it's happened in San Diego County at all. Yusef Miller, who is with the group Justice for Earl McNeil, voiced his concerns to the commission, saying the community is losing confidence in it. They don't meet regularly. They're not fully staffed. I mean, we don't feel that they're committed to the process enough, and there's no mechanism to make them committed. The CPRC is trying to address some long-standing concerns with new rules. The commission will now review department procedures and training at least twice a year. Also, the review subcommittee will now be required to attempt to meet at least once a month rather than quarterly. Is there a need for improvement? Absolutely. I mean, if, if you ever get to the point where you feel you don't need improvement, then I think you, you, you failed as an entity. Um, so no, absolutely. And, and I think today was a perfect example as to, the, to what those objectives are. Jade Hindman. Motion to adjourn. KPBS News. The commission says it will need to wait for the McNeil investigation to play out before it can take action and that it could stretch into next year. California is closer to becoming the first state in the nation to eliminate cash bail. SB 10 is the result of nearly two years of work on bail reform by Democrats in the state legislature. A full vote is expected sometime next week. Those charged with a felony and deemed low risk to the public would be released within one day of booking. Individual counties would determine on their own assessment system for those deemed higher risk by the courts. We have in baked in our law until this law hopefully passes the assembly floor next week and signed by the governor. A system that punishes people, that takes away their liberty, that treats them differently because they have less money in their pocket. A previous bail reform bill was defeated last year, but the move to allow more local control in the process helped the current bill gain support. If approved and signed by the governor, cash bail would end as soon as 2020. The arson case against the man accused of setting the holy fire is on hold. A judge in Santa Ana ordered a mental health eva evaluation for Forrest Clark after several outbursts in court today. Clark is accused of intentionally setting a fire that destroyed 18 homes in the Lake Elsinore area. Firefighters are still working to contain the fire, which has burned more than 20,000 acres. Governor Jerry Brown is being urged to order a special session to deal with wildfires. Supporters say there is not enough time to deal with underlying issues like forest management. Lawmakers will end their current session in a couple of weeks. Governor Brown has called for a special committee on wildfires, but critics say that's not enough. More than 500 immigrant children are still separated from their parents. Most have parents who are now deported. KPBS immigration reporter Jean Guerrero has the latest on the federal court case playing out in San Diego. In a phone briefing today, the parties discussed a few different ongoing issues. 
the number of kids who are still separated, the judges' thoughts on the reunification progress, and where the reunifications should take place. More than 500 children remain separated, and the ACLU says there are more than 300 parents who've been deported. The ACLU says it has succeeded in reaching less than 50 of those. That's because phone numbers provided by the government appear to be largely inoperative. But federal judge Dana Sabra says the latest reunification plan looks excellent and that he doesn't think this undertaking can ever be perfect or restore all rights because of the enormity of the effort. There's still an unresolved issue, though. That's where the government is going to reunite children with parents who were deported after they were separated. The ACLU says some of these families should be reunified in the U.S., but the government wants to reunite everyone in their home countries. The judge says he's inclined to side with the U.S. government because of jurisdictional and practical concerns. But he's giving the parties until next Thursday to confer on this issue. Jean Guerrero, KPBS News. The city of San Diego could soon have to make a $5 million payment as part of the fallout from the failed convention center measure. KPBS reporter Matt Hoffman says the mayor is now weighing in on the deal. It's been over a week since we found out that voters wouldn't see a convention center expansion measure on the November ballot, and that could end up costing the city of San Diego millions of dollars. In June, the mayor announced a deal between the city, the Port of San Diego, and landhold leaseholder Fifth Avenue Landing. The deal said the port would make a $5 million down payment on behalf of the city to secure land for a convention center expansion. But that deal stipulated if the Citizens Initiative did not pass in November, the city would lose the payment. We know that initiative did not have enough signatures to automatically qualify for this November's ballot. But it could qualify for the 2020 ballot, and Mayor Faulkner says a special election is also possible. We need this now. We don't want to wait two years from now. So, look, it's that important that we're continuing to be pushing while the signatures would be counted because so many San Diegans came together, Democrat, Republican. This is the right thing to do for our city to move forward. Uh, so we're going to keep pushing. Do you know if it's possible to call a special election or do you know if that's something? It's always possible. Sure. Okay. Now, Mayor Faulkner did ask the council to call a special election for a similar expansion in 2017, but they decided otherwise. KPBS found out the three-party deal was signed in June, and the city has 60 days to give the down payment to the port. By some counts, that deadline is Monday. So is the city still on the hook for that money? Mayor Faulkner says there are a number of options on the table, and all parties are having positive discussions. Faulkner says we'll know more on Monday. Matt Hoffman, KPBS News. The family of Earl McNeil continues to press national city leaders for answers. The feds try to wriggle out of a lawsuit over sewage in the South Bay, and newspapers push back on attacks by President Trump. Join us for the KPBS Roundtable tonight at 8.30. Coffee shops might soon be able to take down cancer warning signs. State health officials say they're ready to change a law that requires public notice if certain chemicals are present. One of those chemicals is found in roasted coffee beans, but experts say the benefits of coffee far outweigh the risk. We've uh, reviewed more than a thousand scientific studies and come to the conclusion that coffee consumption does not pose a significant risk of cancer. And so we've proposed a regulation that states that. And if the regulation is approved and adopted, you would not need to have warnings in uh, coffee shops over a cancer risk from coffee consumption. The state agency in charge of the rule change is taking public comment. A formal action will follow. The coffee shops would be able to remove the signs at the start of next year. There's a lot of attention this week on Alzheimer's disease. KPBS health reporter Susan Murphy tells us about the opening of a new memory village and how researchers are sharing their work in San Diego. It's the 1950s all over again in a miniature village built inside a warehouse in Chula Vista. Dozens of people with Alzheimer's, many in their 80s, are being encouraged to revive their memories of the bygone era at Glenner Town Square. Remember, Alzheimer's disease is, is, is a brutal disease, and we're really trying to create an experience for people that is very dignified um, and is very consistent with where their um, life has taken them. Scott Tardy is creator of the town and CEO of the nonprofit George G. Glenner Alzheimer's Family Centers. So really designed to be um, 
like a functioning city, right? I mean, we have 10,000 square feet, 24 foot ceilings, natural skylights throughout. People with Alzheimer's suffer from a degenerative disease marked by memory loss, especially short-term impairment. Their minds are often trapped decades in the past. The new adult daycare center is working to help people regain long-term memories to improve their quality of life. Trained caregivers guide small groups through a dozen colorful and interactive storefronts and stations. Spend about 45 or 50 minutes in each storefront receiving customized programming based on somebody's likes, interest levels, cognitive functioning. Including a vintage store, movie theater, and a little blue house. So it kind of looks like grandma's kitchen, and we do all kinds of activities there, including um, playing cards, listening to music. Um, right now we're doing an art program. Each area is designed with 1950s artifacts to reflect their lives when they were in their teens or 20s. Rotary dial phones, newspapers from back in the day, they're all prompts for social engagement. Tardy says the village is designed around a concept called reminiscence therapy. That's a lot of times when people make their first memories, if you will. So graduating high school, graduating college, marriage, children, first jobs. Tardy, who has worked with Alzheimer's patients for two decades, says triggering memories helps reduce anxiety. He says the village also gives people a sense of purpose. If they used to work in an office, we have an office. If they used to visit a diner, we have a diner. If they like enjoy, uh, they like to go to the library and enjoy books, we have a library. Participants can tinker with an old Ford at the gas station. They can hold baby dolls at the clinic. Mm -hmm. Play pool or shoot hoops at the pub. There we go. Lunch is served at Ruby's Diner with their favorite oldies playing from a jukebox. While the Alzheimer's patients are remembering the past, researchers have converged in San Diego to focus on the present. Heather Snyder is National Senior Director of Scientific Operations at the Alzheimer's Association. There are over 5.7 million Americans living with Alzheimer's today, more than 15 million people that are providing care and support for someone living with Alzheimer's or dementia. In San Diego County, 84,000 people have Alzheimer's disease or dementia. Snyder says more than 200 clinical trials are underway in the search for an Alzheimer's treatment. When we look across that entire pipeline, we see drugs, for instance, or experimental drugs, for instance, that are targeting the beta amyloid protein. This is one of the hallmark brain changes that we see in Alzheimer's, the clumps of the beta amyloid protein. While there's promise, Snyder says there's currently no cure and no therapy to slow the progression. But where, where we are now is our understanding that the biology is changing a decade or more before an individual's memories are changed or affected. It gives us an opportunity to think about, can we intervene at that earlier time point and change the trajectory? Snyder says one encouraging new study involving 9,000 people shows that aggressively lowering systolic blood pressure to 120 could significantly reduce the risk of the disease. 19% less people develop mild cognitive impairment and 15% less people develop mild cognitive impairment and dementia. For now, the disease is the third leading cause of death in San Diego. By the year 2030, the number of people in the county diagnosed with Alzheimer's or dementia is expected to soar 36 percent. At Glenertown Square, Scott Tardy is hoping to make the disease more tolerable for patients and their families. He says the region is not prepared for the future. We have to be ready for this influx because you have all these baby boomers coming through that are going to, at some point, need services. And the greatest predictor of Alzheimer's disease is age. Susan Murphy, KPBS News. Plans are underway to open 200 new Alzheimer's villages across the country, including six more here in San Diego County. Local mountains and deserts will see fewer thunderstorms tonight as we start the weekend. Justin Pavic has details in tonight's forecast. Well, the surf is still a concern as we go throughout the evening hours, especially those south-facing beaches throughout San Diego and Orange Counties. The increased rip 
rip current risk again is going to be a danger. Otherwise, the mountain storms will be dwindling over the course of the next couple of days. We'll stay warm though. Temperatures could actually rise a degree or two further over the inland valleys and possibly we could see some changes as we head into next week. How about the weekend here for tomorrow evening? The Padres taking on the Diamondbacks out of Petco. Looking pretty good, right? 80 degrees first pitch temperature with some sunshine around. Satellite and radar pretty quiet here as we talk about uh, the coastal again communities and also some of the valley locations. Now yesterday we had some showers and some thunderstorms again uh, bubbling up over the mountainous terrain north of Borrego Springs and not too far from Mount Laguna. Pretty quiet again for today. We look at the grand scheme of things. Much of the moisture is further off toward the east today. Extreme eastern California and back into Arizona. So thunderstorm production is going down and we'll likely see a very minimal impacts here toward the immediate coast in terms of the marine layer. For tonight, Oceanside down to 70, San Diego 74, Chula Vista down to 71, Borrego Springs, the warm location as they normally are, down into the 80s. It will be humid throughout the overnight with again lows into the 70s. High pressure back in control. The heat will expand as we kick off the upcoming weekend. Notice the bulk of the showers and thunderstorms well off to the east. High temperature wise for tomorrow still above normal San Diego 83 should be talking mid to upper 70s Oceanside 82 Ramona 90 Borrego Springs up to 107 and for the weekend notice high pressure not moving around that much at all for coastal communities look at temperatures they could climb a degree or so by mid next week inlet as well slight warming trend we stay dry over the mountainous terrain could see some thunderstorms increasing maybe a little uptick in monsoonal moisture come Tuesday and Wednesday. And we could even see a storm spark off throughout the deserts by early next week. For KPBS News, I'm meteorologist Justin Pavic. Back to you, Ebony. One of the biggest events in horse racing will return to Del Mar. Organizers of the Breeders' Cup Championships announced today that the 2021 event will be held at the Del Mar racetrack. The Breeders' Cup was held at Del Mar for the first time last year. The two-day event drew close to 40,000 people and generated a record amount of betting. A long-term prediction for the economy, and could there be an Amazon movie theater in San Diego? Earlier today, I spoke with SDSU marketing lecturer Mira Kopik for the Friday Business Report. Mira, the Congressional Budget Office released a report earlier this week. What exactly is this report, and what can it tell us about the economy? Well, the Congressional Budget Office is the nonpartisan arm of the of Congress that helps evaluate. Um, the quality of, of various initiatives, you know, whether it's going to be worth it or not to vote for it. Um, and, and so the Congressional Budget Office in this report said that the economy would grow 3.1% this year, which is great. It's a 20% growth over last year, but there's a lot of ominous warning signs here uh, because in this report, the CBO said that next year the economy would grow at 2.4% and getting into recession territory by 2020 with 1.7% growth. And the bigger warning is that they're saying that the deficits will increase from $800 billion this year, which is more than double than it was in 2016, to over a trillion dollars. And there's a lot of factors that drive this that people need to know and be aware of uh, when thinking about running a business or, or, or even personally. And those factors are um, right now real wages, the unemployment is low but, and real wages have increased, but inflation is now eating into it where actually people are losing every day um, the, their, their wages. So wages went up 2.7%, but inflation is up 2.9%. So real wage growth is declining. Consumers in the first half of the year loaded up on a lot of debt that they're gonna have to pay off. So spending in the future is gonna be a challenge. Businesses took advantage of the tax cut uh, and spent almost a trillion dollars in stock buybacks, benefiting some key investors, but not necessarily putting it back into wage growth or, or big investments in, in their businesses. And lastly, productivity has been flat the last couple of years. So all these factors combined drive the CBO saying that you know next year's growth and the year after is going to be difficult. And now moving over to Landmark Theaters, which is a chain that primarily shows independent films from what I understand. And we have two locations here in San Diego. Right. Amazon has expressed interest in buying Landmark Theaters. Um, how will this improve um, Amazon's portfolio? Well, w this is a big step in, in Amazon picking 
uh, business segments so that have physical locations that could be really advantageous to its business model. So this means that they can verti vertically integrate their movie studio, their television studio, their music service, and have a channel of distribution for that. Um, they're buying this company from Mark Cuban, uh, and, and there's other bidders in there, so we don't know who's going to actually buy it. But what's interesting about Amazon is it will create more value. The same way Amazon has done a great job at trying to integrate uh, Whole Foods into its Amazon Prime membership offering free grocery delivery or pickup and, and special discounts, they're going to do the same thing with entertainment. Now, there's one thing potentially stopping them, and that is a government consent decree that was uh, set forth in 1949 that prohibited movie studios from buying distribution or theater chains. That decree is still into, in effect. So technically, as an owner of a studio, Amazon can't do it. But the government has recently said they're open to um, eliminating that decree, and uh, Amazon buying Landmark will be a big test of that. Very interesting. Mira Kopik, SDSU Marketing Lecturer, thanks for joining us. Thank you. KPBS film critic Beth Accomando is not too pleased with the new Mark Wahlberg action film, Mal 22, that opens today. And here's why. I'm an action junkie. I love nothing more than the adrenaline rush you get from the pure kinetic energy of a good action film. But I felt no adrenaline, only anger seething through my veins after watching Mile 22. Although Mark Wahlberg is billed as the star, it's Iko Uwais I came to see. He's the brilliant action star of the two Indonesian raid movies. For Mile 22, he performed and choreographed fight scenes. Then director Peter Berg threw all the footage in a blender and spit out a sludge that doesn't allow you to appreciate any of the flavors of the action. Overcutting is what you do when you have a talentless clod that you have to make look good. Uwais needs no such help. Just put him on screen and let him go. Maybe the film's trying to reflect Wahlberg's ADHD character or the chaotic state of the world, but the style destroys what could have been a lean, mean political thriller about getting an asset a mere 22 miles from an embassy to a plane. Beth Accomando, KPBS News. San Diego students got ready for the first day of school with a special cookout today. She told me I'm um, um, having a barbecue in my Oh, yeah. Hundreds of kids showed up for lunch and a backpack giveaway at Sherman Elementary. Volunteers had the bag stuffed with supplies from notebooks to calculators. One San Diego will continue these backpack giveaways until next week. More than 3 million people call San Diego and Imperial County home with 9,000 square miles of space. As part of our KPBS Explore project, we traveled to five communities to find out what makes these places so special. Tonight, we visit the South Bay. Here's the latest from our series, Where I Come From. There are more liquor stores than there are grocery stores. Access to food in National City is very limited and that's a very huge concern for community members is what they call National City being a food desert. We need a better food system here. We need to create uh, organic waste because there's not even, I mean, there's not a sprouts, there's not nothing like that. We're a part of the market, so. You can get some things, but um, it would be great if there was a farmer's market. We actually have one of the highest diabetes are concerns as far as health on, the, on children and in the youth. The kiddos, uh, that they need more exercise, um, green areas, there's a beautiful park right, right here. The west side of National City has historically been uh, the cause of a lot of health, negative health impacts in the youth high asthma rates, some of the highest asthma rates in the country. Some of the funds might have not been directed to certain areas as much as others. You had residential right next to like an automotive center that did painting or car work that released a lot of pollutants into the air. And so a lot of those residents started seeing high rates of asthma. National City tends to get overlooked because we are sandwiched between two barrios or two communities that are focused on the majority of the time. Chula Vista, which is huge, and Barrio Logan, which is very hip and happening right now. There's this concerted effort by community members, local business, supported early on all sides, 
to um, introduce healthy options and a healthy lifestyle um, to the communities here. Things have to evolve, things have to change, so National City is going to have to trust those people that are pushing the envelope. You can watch the rest of the series at kpbs.org slash where I come from. And we'd like to hear what you think about the series. Join the conversation on the KPBS Facebook page. And you can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.